Okay, uh, we start today by looking at sums of random variables. So, and as I said, uh, we are heading towards uh, deducing or at least uh, understanding some limit laws. Uh, such as how the Gaussian emerges in many cases, etc. So, I start by saying asking a very simple question and that is the following. Suppose I have a set of random variables, Gaussian random variables and let us denote them by x1, x2 up to xn and each of them is a Gaussian random variable, all of which are identically distributed. So, they are independent, statistically independent, identically distributed random variables and there is an abbreviation for this. So, independent, identically distributed random variables, IID RVs, each of which is a Gaussian distribution, has a Gaussian distribution and it is a normal distribution with a mean mu and a variance sigma squared and it is generally denoted in this fashion a normal distribution with mean mu and sigma squared. So, that is just notation to say that the random variable is a Gaussian with this specified mean and variance okay. and each of them has exactly the same distribution. Then the question is what is the distribution of a variable which I will define as z n, this is equal to x 1 plus etcetera up to x n minus n times the mean divided by and I am going to scale it out to make it dimensionless here, divided by uh, n sigma squared square root. Remember sigma is the standard deviation for each one of them and this is just the sum of the variances out here, n sigma squared because the variances of independent random variables add and I take a square root. So, what is the distribution of this z n? That is the question. And now of course, you can do this the hard way, you can say I write its probability distribution by writing a product of the distributions of all these variables out here, integrating over all the sample spaces of each of these variables and then imposing a delta function constraint that this combination should be equal to that. That is a painful way of doing it in this case. On the other hand, I argue that each of these variables, if I consider a variable like x i minus mu, I subtract the mean out in this case, these are all independently distributed and each of these fellows, these, these variables has a variance sigma squared and therefore, the sum of all these fellows has variance n times this and I immediately write down what the characteristic function is or what the moment generating function is or what better still the cumulant generating function for this whole thing. So, the cumulant generating function of z n, this thing here is equal to, there is no mean because the mean is 0, I have subtracted it out and then it is equal to 1 half sigma squared u squared was the formula for a single Gaussian variable, for n of them it is n sigma squared u squared, but remember I have scaled out each variable by this thing here. So, x i minus mu divided by n sigma squared. I multiplied this random variable by a constant 1 over root n sigma squared and therefore, in the variance it is just this constant squared. So, this is equal to this fellow which is equal to 1 half u squared. So, we have a statement that the cumulant generating function of this sum rescaled by shifting the constant out by removing the mean and dividing by the square root of n sigma squared is just 1 half u squared which implies immediately that z n has distribution, normal distribution of 0 mean and unit variance which is called the standard Gaussian distribution n of 0 comma 1. Okay. So, it is our first interesting result that if you have n of these Gaussian random variables and you subtract out the mean value and divide by suitably rescale it by this factor here which is square root of n times the variance of each of these, then this, this combination 
is normally distributed. For every n, this is true. Okay. You can generalize this result immediately. Consider, for example, this quantity. So let's suppose that uh, you have n Gaussian random variables. And we have uh, a i x sub i sum from 1 to n. So the x's are all Gaussian random variables. And let us suppose that uh, the mean value of any of the x's is some mu i and the variance is some sigma i, but they are all Gaussian random variables. Then what is the distribution of this combination here? That combination is not a very good one. We need to do something better. We need to scale out the, min, the, the mean value, etc. So let's call this uh, equal to uh, let's let's call this z n just for convenience. And let me define a random variable xi n equal to z n minus summation a i mu i. I subtract that out, and I divide by the square root of what should I divide by the square root of? Assuming that uh, this fellow x i has mean mu i and variance sigma i squared. What should I divide by here? Yeah, I should sum from 1 to n a i squared sigma i squared. What would be the distribution of xi sub n? The standard normal distribution, right? So, has distribution n of 0, 1. And that is true for every n. Okay. So, we see that if you do a rescaling, and a translation suitably subtracting a constant. A sum of Gaussian random variables or a linear combination, more generally a linear combination of Gaussian random variables has a Gaussian distribution. So in this sense, the Gaussian is extremely robust. Okay. You take two independent Gaussian random variables, do a linear combination, then some com rescaled version of this uh, sum has a Gaussian distribution once again. Okay. It reproduces itself as you can see. The theorem is actually more general than that. And the statement is the following, and this is one statement of a famous theorem called the central limit theorem. I am saying this very loosely, there is a rigorous way of stating this uh, theorem in its uh, all its generality, but what I am going to do here is simply state it in very, very simple terms, and that is that if you give me a set n random variables x1 to xn, they need not be identically distributed x1, x2, xn. And let us to start with look at iid rvs, does not matter, iid rvs. Each of them uh, xi has a mean mu i and a variance sigma i. Uh, sigma i squared, which is which are finite. So we want the first two moments of every uh, the variance and the mean of every one of these variables to be some finite value. Then one can ask what happens to the sum sigma x i i equal to one to n minus uh, the mean value summation mu i. 1 to n rescaled by this uh, summation sigma i squared. Okay. And now if you say these x's are distributed by any arbitrary distribution which has a finite uh, mean and a finite variance, independent of what that distribution is, the statement is that the limit as n tends to infinity of this combination here has a normal distribution. Okay. 
So, that is the statement of the central limit theorem. It says no matter what distribution you start with, you will end up with the Gaussian distribution. And what we would like to do is to look at a couple of toy models and see if this is really true and how it comes about rather than how to prove this statement. This is a rigorous proof of this theorem and it is called generalizations. What we will do is to look at the simplest instance, simplest possible um, example toy model and see exactly where it comes from, where does it become, how does it become Gaussian and so on and that is an instructive lesson. So, let us do the following. Let us look at uh, a set of n variables. Let us uh, first do the following. Let us look at a variable x uh, which is in the sample space 0 to 1 and p of x equal to 1. So, this is uniformly distributed in the unit interval between 0 and 1. So, if I plot this uh, p of x, uh, it is just this. So, the average value is a half and so on and so forth. What is the variance? So, it is clear that x equal to a half because it is just uniformly distributed and uh, the mean square um, is the integral of x squared from 0 to 1 which is one third, one third and you subtract half whole squared. So, it says the variance of x equal to one third minus one fourth equal to 1 over 12. Now, I ask what happens if I have two of these variables? If I add two of these variables, what does the distribution look like? So, let us call, uh, let us have another such variable y, which is also, uh, let us let us say we got uh, a y, which is also element of 0, 1, distributed in exactly the same way out here. Then the question is what is the distribution of a variable z, which is defined as x plus y? what is the sample space of z? 0 to 2 in this case. So, we immediately write down p of z, the probability density function of this variable z must be equal to integral 0 to 1 dx, integral 0 to 1 dy, p of x. Well, it is 1 in this case, p of y that is also 1 in this case. I do not want to confuse with this symbol here. Now, let me call this rho. you have p of x, p of y, delta function of uh, uh, x plus y minus z. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is 1, this is 1. So, we got to do this integral. It is as simple as that. Mm -hmm. But we got to be a little cautious doing this delta function integral. And that is done as follows. I draw a picture and here is x, here is y, here is the origin and the integral is over the unit square 0 to 1. Those are the boundaries of that is the interval in which each of, each of these variables takes values. And now, I try to impose the condition that x plus y is some number z between 0 and 2. Okay. If it is 0, the, the graph looks like this. So, this is the curve x plus y equal to 0 or y is minus x, 45 degree line, 135 degree line this way. And as long as z is less than 1, it is clear that the line goes something like this. So, this is x plus y equal to z for z less than 1. And what is the value of this integral? Well, look at it this way. I do the y integral first and then I do the x integral. When I do the y integral, I must see if the delta function fires or not. So, as I move up in y, for every value of x, there exists a legitimate value of y such that x plus y is equal to z, provided x is less than this value, which is z. And then I can just finish off the integral completely. But 
as soon as x exceeds z the curve looks like this as, as soon as it exceeds uh, 1 it starts looking in cutting in at these two points. So, till z hits 1 you are fine it is just an integral in x running from 0 to 1. So, it says that you can get rid of the delta function constraint and write rho of z equal to integral 0 to z dx because the y integration is gone the delta function has taken care of it. But the region of integration over x has been curtailed not from 0 to 1 but 0 to z okay. So, this is equal to z itself right up to 1 okay. What happens beyond that is that the curve looks like this. So, this is x plus y equal to z and z is uh, 1 less than equal to z less than equal to 2. What is the range of integration now in x if I finish this uh, delta function constraint? As I move up in y, I have a contribution as long as x is bigger than this value, whatever it is, only if x is less bigger than that value right up to 1, right up to this point 1, okay. And what is this value? This straight line here, this, this point here y is 1 and you are on the curve x plus y is this guy here. So, what is this value here? z minus 1. So, this is equal to z minus 1 up to 1 dx equal to 2 minus z. So, you see how the shape changes as soon as you have this uh, z crossing 1. And so, therefore, there is a point where this thing is sharply peaked this value and if you write uh, what the distribution looks like. So, here is z, here is rho of z, there is actually something like this. At uh, z equal to 1, it goes up to 1. So, it is like this. looks like that. Okay. So, what was flat as soon as you add two of them has become a little conical thing like that triangular distribution okay. and it is normalized because the area under this curve is half the base in times the height, the height is unity and the base is 2. So, it is 1. Okay. So, this is what is going to happen successively. I add more and more of these variables, but you see if I had one more variable I had x, y, z and then you call w the sum for example, then you are going to have an integral which is in the first instance going to constrain this to 1 minus something and then 1 minus x minus whatever. So, it is going to be more and more complicated as I go down here. So, this is a very foolish way of doing this when you have more than two variables. In fact, what will happen at the next stage and you should do this numerically to see what the shape changes like. At the next stage, it is going to go something like and so on it will go right up to 3 etcetera. I can get rid of that spread all the way by subtracting the means each time, but you see the shape changing all the time it is getting the range is getting wider and wider and the shape is changing. So, we would like to see what happens when you put a very large number of these and then take the limit when the number goes to infinity. And the way to do this is as follows. So, let us define uh, z n to be equal to x 1 plus up to x n minus uh, the mean and the mean for each of these is a half. So, let us define this to be n over 2 divided by uh, the variance. What is the variance of each of these? It is 1 twelfth as we saw and for n of them it is just n over 12 and I want to divide by variance. So let me define z n in this fashion and I ask now what is the distribution of this z n okay, the probability density function. Okay. Let us call that as variable this value z. So, this is equal to integral 0 to 1 d x 1 0 to 1 d x n in this fashion 
and then the p's and all of them are unity, this is all uniformly distributed over the unit interval and then a delta function of z minus z n, where little z n is a summation x sub n 1 to n minus n over 2 divided by root n over 2. That is the integral I have to do, okay. but it is not a foolish to try to do it as it is because as you can see the constraints are going to keep on adding, multiplying here. So the way to do it is to try to factor this into a product of integrals. Okay. And we do that by writing a representation for this as the Fourier representation, a minus infinity to infinity uh, dk e to the i k x e to the i k uh, what are the z minus z n. So I replace the delta function by that. Hmm? And what happens to rho of z? This becomes equal to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity dk e to the i k z that comes out and then I have an integral 0 to 1 dx1 uh, e to the mm, z n is going to be e to the i k. I am just concerned about that n over 2, what happened to that? Um, Oh yeah, it is sitting there, it is very much there, so we got to take care of that. So let us do that. This is e to the i k, there is a minus z n, so there is a plus n over 2 there, uh, e to the i k n over 2, this minus and that minus goes away and then root 12 over n and this is uh, 2 root 3 and then there is an n, so let us write this as square root of 3 n. That factor is there, we cannot avoid it. And then an integral from 0 to 1, say dx1 for instance, let us write that first, uh, e to the minus i k uh, x1 and then there is this guy, root 12 over n x1. Okay. Yes this fashion and that is it, but then the same integral gets repeated. Right? So let us just write this as dx and take this to the power n. <coughs> it is perfectly all right. So this becomes and that is a trivial integral to do. So rho of z is uh, uh, let us let us first simplify this integral and see what this is. Mm, let us put i equal to integral 0 to 1 uh, dx e to the minus i k and what do you get here? This is 2 root 3, right? To, uh, root 12 over n x which is equal to e to the minus i k. Uh, minus 2 i k root 3 over n minus 1 divided by minus i k uh, 2 i k root 3 over n. Doing this definite integral, right. And let us pull out uh, this factor. So this is equal to e to the minus i k root 3 over n and then this is going to appear with a plus exponent there. There is a minus here. That is minus 2i sin of this guy, right? So minus 2i sin of uh, k root 3 over n divided by uh, minus 2i k root 3 over n. Hmm? 
watch all the minus signs and so on because I do not swear to this thing. Uh, I think it is okay. If it is wrong, I blame you. So, this cancels out here and that is i, but what is appearing is i to the power n. So, this whole thing raised to the power n, let us put that in. If I raise this to the power n, this becomes square root of 3 n. So, that neatly becomes e to the minus i k square root of 3 n that is going to cancel against this and then there is a sign k root 3 over n over k root 3 over n to the power n. That is the answer which is equal to So, that is rho of z. It is obviously the Fourier transform of Fourier inverse Fourier transform of this guy. That is what rho of z is. Now, we are in good shape because this factor cancels against that and all you got to do is to look at the behavior of this as n becomes larger and larger. What happens to this guy as n becomes larger? The argument goes to 0 as you can see. So, it is like sin x over x. And as, n, and as x goes to 0, the limit is 1, right. The next term will be a correction of order 1 over n because sin x is x minus x cubed over 6, the next term. So, what we need to do is to find this ratio here becomes uh, 1 minus the square of this guy. So, k squared, 3k squared over n and then there is a 6 out here, that is the next term raised to the power n and we need limit n tends to infinity. This guy, hmm? which is equal to e to the minus k squared over 2. Right? So, it is we are home because it immediately says that rho of z in the limit as n tends to infinity tends to 1 over 2 pi integral minus infinity to infinity e t k e to the i k z e to the minus k squared over 2. Okay. Well, that is a Gaussian with variance equal to 1 out here. So, the inverse transform is also a Gaussian which implies this is equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus. which implies that z n has distribution n zero mean unit variance okay because that's precisely what the inverse fourier or transform of this guy is by the way you can do this integral by completing squares etc etc and you will end up with this result here this integral will give you a square root of pi that cancels and gives you a 2 square root of pi in the denominator. Okay. So, you see we started with a distribution which looked nothing like a Gaussian, a flat distribution and the variable was 0 to 1, hmm. but yet as you kept adding stuff to it, we are ending up with a Gaussian distribution and the random variable can take on values all the way from minus infinity to infinity because we made sure that negative values could be reached because we subtracted out that mean part. So, it got centered at the origin and now the variable can take on all values minus infinity to infinity. Very important to note that this is the only limit in which there is this, uh, distribution possible. You see what happens is uh, that we subtracted out something which is linear in n because it, the means were all subtracted, but divided by something which was the square root of n and that gave the right scaling so that you end up with a Gaussian distribution. Actually, the theorem is a little more general than that. We could have variables which had different distributions and still you would have similar properties, but that gets a little more intricate. Generally, you are used, you, uh, you encounter cases where they are all IID RVs, some kind. 
So, although I have done this for the case of this uniform distribution, the same thing is actually true if you had any distribution which has a finite variance and mean okay, with suitable rescaling. So, the statement is that if you have IIDs of this kind, then uh, if you have IID RVs of this kind, then there exist constants A and B such that uh, the variable uh, summation x i 1 to n minus some constant b rescaled by some factor a sub n, n dependent positive quantity and that is some real number b sub n. There exist a n and b n such that the limit of this as n tends to infinity goes to a Gaussian distribution. So, that is the statement of the central limit theorem. We did this in a very simple scalar way, just you know one dimensional variables and so on, but it does not matter what the dimensionality is does not matter at all and this is the famous random walk problem about which we are going to say a great deal. So, let me do that step by step and then we will see how the central limit theorem emerges. We are going to talk about the random walk on discrete lattices, but right now in connection with the central limit theorem, let us just look at the problem of a random flight. So, let us call this the problem of random flights. And the rule is the following. I start in three dimensional space, actually it is independent of the dimensionality of the space as well. I start in three dimensional space at some origin and I take a step of fixed length L in some arbitrary direction in three dimensional space. So, I fly from this point to that point and this vector let us call it R 1. Okay. Having reached this at the next time step and I do this in discrete time at the end of every time step, I take a discrete step whose length is L, magnitude is L, but the direction is anywhere in space. So, the next time around I go here and then I go there. I can cross my path, earlier path, it does not matter, no constraints at all, whatever. So, this is vector r 2, this is vector r 3 and so on and I do this for some n steps. Okay. And let us suppose that the at the end of the n step, I am here, this is r n, etcetera. And the end to end distance from here to here, let us call it r. I should put a subscript n here actually. So, let us do that r n and I ask what is the probability density function of this vector r n, r sub n. Okay. It is a three dimensional vector, so I need to know its distribution in space as well as uh, in, in direction as well as in magnitude. So, I ask what is the PDF? of uh, r sub n which is equal to r 1 plus dot r plus r n. Okay. It will be some quantity, let me denote it by the following. Let me denote it as p of r n because it is dependent on the number of time steps that I have and I would like to look at it and the limit little n tends to infinity. Okay. And here I'm t I should really put a time step also, so that I have time included in a dimensional way. So, some time step tau for example. Uh, we can put that later, but just to remind myself of this, let us put a tau here and call this a time step. I am doing this in anticipation of the fact that later we are going to look at things in continuous time. So, I need to have a quantity of dimensions time. Right now for this problem, it is only the n that is relevant. It is only the number of steps that is relevant. I want to know what this quantity is. It should clearly be normalized. So, it is clear that this integrated over all space d 3 r should be equal to 1 at every tau for at every n, this should be the case. Okay, so, the whole thing should be normalized. And the random variable is a sum of n random variables, all of which are identically distributed except each variable is a vector in three dimensions. 
only the length is fixed, but the direction is arbitrary completely. So, let us go about it in the following way. What would be the average value of this r sub n? Intuitively, what would be the average value? It should be 0 because it is a vector, so it is as likely to point in one direction as in the opposite direction with equal <laughs> weight. So, I expect this should be 0. When we of course, find the distribution exactly, we should verify if this is so, but it is trivially true that this is equal to 0. What would be the mean square value? That means, the dot product of this with itself, what would that be? Okay. So, what we are now asking for is the expectation value of R n dotted with itself. So, summation i equal to 1 to n, summation j equal to 1 to n R i dot R j. This is what we are asking for, but this summation is, is uh, commutes with the operation of taking averages. So, it is this. What is this angular bracket over, average over what? Over the collection or ensemble of what? Over possible all possible realizations, all possible random walks, random flights of n steps, all possible steps. That is what I have to take the arithmetic average over, but what we are trying to do is to find the probability distribution itself, so that these ensemble averages can be replaced by averages over. Uh, the, the weighted averages over the probability densities. Okay. But now, this guy here is equal to, let us suppose the length of each of these is L, length equal to L. Okay. Then this dot product has n diagonal terms where i is equal to j. And then of course, r i dot r i is just the square of the magnitude of this vector which is L squared and there are n of these guys. So, this is n L squared plus summation i j, but i not equal to j in this case r i dot r j. Now, if r i is a vector in some direction like this and r j is a vector in some direction like this, bringing them down to the same common tail here and theta i j is the angle between these two vectors. Then, since the magnitudes of these vectors is fixed, all we have to do is to multiply this by L squared and take the average value of cos theta i j. Well, that is what the dot product means. Okay. But what is this average equal to? It has got to be 0 because for every such configuration there is an equal equally probable configuration like that in which the other the fellow points in the other direction okay. and cos theta is minus cos pi minus theta. So, these two contributions cancel each other right. So, this goes away immediately this is identically 0 and you end up with R n squared is n times L squared and since the average is 0 average value of the vector R n is 0, this is the variance. So, if you take a random flight and ask for the end to end vector, displacement vector, the variance of that vector is proportional to n, okay. not n squared, but n. So, the standard deviation is turning out to be square root of n. The root mean square displacement is turning out to be proportional to the square root of n. Now, if n is proportional to time, you can see that the distance covered, the root mean square distance covered is going like the square root of time, which is the famous random walk. Because if I walk purposefully in this direction at a constant speed, the distance I cover is proportional to the time. But if I walk meaninglessly meandering in random directions, then my mean displacement is 0, but the end to end distance that is not 0, the mean root mean square distance is going to be proportional to the square root of the time elapsed when I do a random walk. This is typical behavior of typically diffusive behavior. Okay. As we will see, there are exceptions to it when there are uh, certain physical conditions met, but in general, this is going to happen. That the root mean square displacement is going to become proportional to the square root of the time. Right? 
or the vari mean square distance is going to go like uh, the time itself, first power of time. So, this is crucial. That is just a dimensional constant, but this is crucial. So, we already have some valuable information. What we need, however, is this distribution, the full probability distribution function. So, let us write it out and see what happens. We need now to integrate over all these guys. So, we put in a delta function constraint and we say P of R n tau is equal to a delta function of R minus this vector here. Okay. And the standard trick of course, is to write that delta function in a Fourier representation immediately. So, I am going to have d 3 r 1, d 3 r 2 up to d 3 r n. times the distribution of each one of these guys that is needed for each of these steps. And since it is a one step quantity, let me call it P 1 of R 1, P 1 of R n. We have still got to write down the probability density function of a single step that is going to be my input. And then a delta function, a three dimensional delta function of R minus R 1 minus minus r n in this fashion. That is what this guy is. And I write a Fourier representation for this and bring that integral to the left hand side. So, I have a p of r n tau equal to 1 over 2 pi whole cubed. It is in three dimensions. Integral d 3 k times e to the power minus i k dot whatever it is r. So, e to the minus i k dot r and then I have e to the minus i k dot r 1, e to the i k dot r 1, e to the i k dot r 2 etcetera times this fellow here. And it is the same integral repeated for all of them. So, it is some integral to the power n and what is that integral? It is equal to integral d 3 r, forget the index now, not needed, e to the power i k dot r p 1 of r raised to the power n. This is what we need. Okay. Now, what is p 1 going to be? First of all, what is going to be the physical dimensions of P 1? Because I want P 1 of r integrated over all components of r to be equal to 1. So, it is got to be 1 over length cubed. I need a third power. But what we do know about this is that you are asking for the distribution of a vector whose length is L and which is moving about it has got all directions possible. It can be, its uh, tip can be anywhere on a sphere of uh, on the surface of a sphere of radius r. So, this has got to be proportional to a delta function of r minus l. It is got to be proportional to that, right. And what is the constant of proportionality? How do you discover what that is? You normalize, you normalize this, but over all directions. And what is the total solid angle? 4 pi. So, you divide by 4 pi. And the volume element also has an r squared dr, but r has got to be equal to l, otherwise it is 0, right. And that is got to be divided out, so it is 4 pi l squared. And that is all it is. Okay. So, that is p 1 of each of these vectors. It is got dimensions of 1 over length cubed because this is 1 over length squared and this delta function of course, has physical dimensions of 1 over the argument which is 1 over length. Okay. So, it is a sharply defined sharp uh, you know at one point is a spike in R and that is it. Okay. So, it is trivial to verify that uh, integral d 3 R p 1 of R equal to 1 u 
is that fact. So, let us put that in, in this integral and see what happens. So, you have integral d 3 r e to the i k dot r and then a delta function of r minus l and a 1 over 4 pi l square. That is what the square bracket is. And I need to do this integral. Okay. Obviously, I should do this in spherical polar coordinates, which is the simplest because this constraint here involves this magnitude r, but I have to take care of the angular variables, integrations, right. What should I do? I should choose, I should choose my polar coordinates in such a way that the polar axis is along the vector that is sticking out. There is a vector k sitting here is not being integrated over. And since this whole thing is spherically symmetric, this region of integration is all space spherically symmetric. This thing is spherically symmetric and that is a scalar. So, it is invariant under rotations of the coordinate axis, which implies that I can choose the orientation of my axis as I please and the integral does not change. And the convenient thing to do is to choose it along the direction of whatever vector is sticking out, because then that i k dot r just becomes magnitude of k magnitude of r times the polar angle and that is theta in this case in spherical polar coordinates. Otherwise, you are in trouble because if you did not do that, the answer does not change, but it is needless complication. Just to tell you what the complication can be, if I choose the axis in some random direction and this vector is k say and that is my vector r and that is the polar axis, the z axis, then if this r has got spherical polar coordinates theta and phi and this fellow has spherical polar coordinates theta prime phi prime, then the angle between these two, the dihedral angle if you call it some gamma, the addition, the law of cosines which you learn in high school or wherever, um, cos gamma, right. In spherical trigonometry, we learn this formula for the cosine. It is the first, uh, it is the simplest instance of the addition theorem for Legendre polynomials, which I presume everybody knows. So, what is this equal to? What is cos gamma in terms of these guys? It is called the law of cosines. You learn this in spherical trigonometry, right, in high school or wherever, first year college or something. So, yes? No? You do not learn it? You do not learn it in college? No, I am I'm, I'm outdated, so now tell me. <laughs> yes, I mean Euclid probably knew it and I am sure he knew it and various other people knew it, but uh, the internet generation does not. <laughs> this is the addition theorem for P1 of what? Okay, it is equal to cos theta, cos theta prime plus it is called the law of cosines. Right. So, if you got two vectors sticking out randomly in space and you know the polar coordinates of each of these, the polar and azimuthal angles, you can tell what the cosine of the dihedral angle between them is. So, it is given by this guy. Okay. So, what you have to do for doing this integral, if you choose the polar coordinate, some polar axis in some arbitrary direction, is to say that for this vector, this vector, and then k dot r is kr cos gamma, and for cos gamma, you have to substitute this in the exponent and then try to do the integrals. It is obviously a horrible mess. Hmm? Much simpler to exploit the fact that you have spherical symmetry in this case and there is a vector stick, sticking out the direction of k. So, you can without loss of generality choose the polar axis along k, which means that the theta prime, the theta for k, this, this quantity theta prime is 0. So, this goes away and cos gamma becomes cos theta, okay, which immediately implies that you can write this as equal to 1 over 4 pi L square integral hmm, 0 to infinity 
they are r squared is sitting out there. There is a delta of r minus l of course, multiplied by e to the i k r cos theta. Now, oh, this is also an integral over theta. What is the range of theta, the polar angle? 0 to pi. So, there is sin theta d theta, but I like to write it as minus 1 to 1 d of cos theta. And then there is an integral over phi, 0 to 2 pi d phi e to the i k r cos theta. Now, you can do the phi integral trivially, you get a 2 pi factor. So, this gives you a 2 pi and the phi goes away. This gives you an e to the i k r cos theta, but cos theta is the integration variable. So, it gives you e to the i k r minus e to the minus i k r over i k r. So, this integral goes away and you get 2 i sin k r over i k r. Okay. The 2 pi goes away with this 4 pi, so it is 1 over L squared. The 2 goes away here, the i goes away here. Okay. And you got a delta of r minus l. So, if you set r equal to l, this factor cancels against that and you are left with sin k l over k l. Okay. So, this whole thing finally becomes something extremely simple. It's a, so, this is equal to sin k l over k l. And this whole thing here becomes sin k l over k l to the power n. That is it. That is it. So, it says P of r is an inverse Fourier transform of this quantity sin k l over k l to the power n. Okay. That is well behaved. As uh, k goes to 0, this fellow goes to 1, so there is no singularity. Otherwise, you would be in trouble. You got to do an integration over k and if there is something in the denominator that blows up faster than 1 over k, you are in trouble. But that does not happen even though it is raised to the power n, this guy here has got a well defined limit. Okay. And this sink function as you know what it behaves like and you raise it to the nth power. Now, you can see that as you increase n, if you increase n here, this number is always less than 1. So, it is essentially going to go to 0 unless except for the contribution from the region near k equal to 0 where this thing goes to 1. So, the dominant portion is near k equal to 0. And in what manner should you take a limit? You should take a limit when L goes to 0 and n goes to infinity in such a way that this guy goes to a finite limit. Then there is a respectable limit here. Now, what does it do for small values of k? This goes like 1 minus k squared L squared over 6 out here. So, if you take a limit, n goes to infinity, L goes to 0 such that n l squared tends to a finite quantity. Then I can replace this l squared by that finite quantity over n and raising it to the power n is going to give me e to the minus k squared. And that is a Gaussian. And its inverse Fourier transform is another Gaussian immediately. So, let us call this uh, uh, let us call this alpha c. Okay. So, this fellow is this guy which is essentially 1 minus k squared. So, I put this equal to this. So, it is alpha over 6 n, uh, 6 n to the power n. Okay. And that tends 
in the limit n tends to infinity e to the minus alpha k square over 6. And the inverse transform of that Gaussian is another Gaussian. That is an interesting exercise to do. How should you do that integral? How do you actually establish that, that it is a Gaussian? So, let us suppose we have done this and we would finally want to find what is the inverse transform of e to the minus alpha k square over 6. What should I do now? I, I should not uh, try, of course, I know that uh, I know for sure that the inverse transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian even in higher dimensions, but what coordinate system should I choose for this? No, no, because there is no need to, there is no, that makes it very hard. It makes it very hard if you try to choose polar coordinates now. You should choose Cartesian coordinates because this here will become k 1 x plus k 2 y plus k 3 z and it will factor and that guy is already in factored form. So, it will be the product of 3 Gaussians which you can write down easily. So, at this stage you should use Cartesian, go back and choose Cartesian coordinates, evaluate in Cartesians. You could do it in polar coordinates, but and you will end up with something which says p of r and e to the minus something times r square. Crucial point, where will alpha sit? Will it sit up here or down here? Downstairs, yeah. So, there is some constant divided by alpha square over alpha. Because the width here is 1 over alpha, the width here is alpha. We will see what that is when we do the diffusion equation. This will turn out to be proportional to time because we are taking the limit n goes to infinity, tau goes to 0 such that n tau goes to the time t. And then this constant here will become dt, the diffusion constant times t. We will see this explicitly. So, this is how random flights in the limit of 0 time step and 0 length step tends to the solution of the diffusion equation in continuous space and time eventually. But it is actually a consequence of the central limit theorem. It really arose because you add all these steps and you end up with, a, remember that each step was not distributed in a Gaussian or anything like that, but this is true. But now I also mention that the individual random variables could have other distributions. We took them to have fixed lengths. Turns out it is of incredible generality. The individual steps need not have the same distribution at all. They need not have the same fixed length. They could in fact be distributed themselves. The steps could themselves have different lengths distributed such that that distribution of step length has a finite variance. That is all you need. The result is also independent of the space dimensionality. does not matter how many dimensions you are in, in space. It is still true, it is still true. Apart from some numerical factors, you would still get a Gaussian variable here. You could have distributions in time, you could have distributions in space. As long as they are respectable distributions with finite variances and so on, this uh, Gaussian, this emergence of this Gaussian form is completely robust. Only when very fundamental quantities like if I did for example, I took a, a problem of random flights in which the different steps are of different lengths chosen from some, drawn from some distribution themselves and that distribution does not have a finite variance. This means that there do occur steps of arbitrarily large lengths such that uh, the mean squared length is not finite. Then you have a very different behavior altogether. The Gaussian gets destroyed. And this is what happens when you have these so called Levy flights and so on. We will talk a little bit about that later on. This is like the strategy used by bacteria when they are in a nutrient solution. They wander around taking random steps, but then after a while they take one big hop, a long distance, and then start doing it again. 
Now, if you have these clusters of clusters of clusters in a self similar way, it is possible to have uh, random box flights which have more non Gaussian behavior in the limit and they are also of practical importance to come back. But otherwise the lesson here is that the Gaussian is very robust, a very uh, huge uh, number of generalizations. I okay. will stop here and we will resume. From here.